Welcome to the Good Life Journey. In today's video, we are going to try to address a question that's been bugging me for quite some time. Why is it that we continue to work as hard as our grandparents did, in an era of unprecedented abundance and despite all the economic growth and technological progress we've experienced over the last century? The 40-hour workweek was already very common in most manufacturing industries since the beginning of the 20th century. Please, can somebody explain to me why, in simple terms, has so little changed over the last 100 years? Why, despite an era of unprecedented abundance, despite the technological progress and the economic growth that we've experienced, why do we continue to toil so hard and work so similar hours to the ones that our grandparents did? It's actually, it's, it's worse than that, because at least for younger generations, our working careers are going to be much longer. We're expected to work longer careers to be able to sustain aging populations. It's not just the layman's intuition here that something needs to be explained. John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s uh, predicted that by our time, the economic growth and technological advancements would have allowed us to reach what he called the promised land, a place where all of our basic needs were met. And incredibly, he predicted that we'd only be working 15 hours per week at present. Of course, this has not been the case. And if anything, as I just mentioned, um, younger, uh, younger generations will likely work harder than their grandparents did. I think the question is also very relevant today. According to analysts, we're in the midst of an AI revolution. And so a key question to ask ourselves is, what's going to happen with all the productivity gains that, are, that result from this technological breakthrough? Will humans, will we finally be able to have more free time? Will we be able to dedicate our time to a broader range of interests? Or somehow will we still manage to create new types of jobs and continue to stay very busy forever? To answer some of these questions, we are going to use some of the ideas found in Dr. James Sussman's book, Work, A History of How We Spend Our Time. Specifically, I will present six a possible reasons that are brought forward in the book that may be able to explain why we continue to work so hard in an era of unprecedented abundance and despite, as I mentioned, the huge technological and economic growth that we've experienced. I think some of these factors will surprise many of you and uh, surprise, I've left the, the most shocking factor for the end of the video, so please stick around. Also, please let me know in the comments, which of these six factors do you think best explains why we continue to work so hard? Do you have any other factor based on your own experience that may explain this? Or do you think it's a combination of some of these factors? I'd be really curious to know. The first possible explanation is status. In today's world, we seek meaning through our jobs and the work that we do. And like it or not, it determines social status, at least in the eyes of others. Unfortunately, it's not only the job titles or the nature of the job that we do that uh, communicates status, it's also giving the appearance of being very busy. Have you noticed that people around you always go out of their way to just to communicate how very busy they are? This it probably is implicitly communicating that their work has meaning, that their work has importance, that their job, uh, that. Yeah, their organization perhaps couldn't function without them going to work every day. The book examines humans' relationship to work, going back all the way to hunter-gatherer societies. In contrast to popular belief, these societies were very well nourished and only worked 15 hours per week. 15 hours per week. Something has definitely changed since then. According to anthropologists that are studying current uh, indigenous peoples today, they managed this because they cared very little for status and for the accumulation of wealth. Their lives were organized around the presumption of abundance in, in, in contrast to scarcity. They didn't have a scarcity mindset. Which brings us to the second factor. The second possible explanation is an inherited scarcity mindset from our farming ancestors. According to the author, our transition to agriculture took place around 12,000 years ago. For the first time, humans were able to collect sufficient energy surpluses that allowed them to gather in larger towns and settlements, and eventually even in big cities. 
However, this transition to agriculture really did take its toll, since for the first time, humans were working far longer hours and much harder than previous hunter-gatherer societies had worked. Up until the Industrial Revolution, these uh, farming societies uh, progressed in cycles. It's true that the, the, the short-term increases in productivity allowed for a fleeting prosperity, which was then soon gobbled up, unfortunately, by growing populations. And this led to a never-ending cycle. So the growing population would always sort of surpass any potential productivity gains that had been achieved through a particular breakthrough in a technology, in a type of crop, etc. And meant that humans were always searching for new land to till to be able to sustain that growing population. This is known as a Malthusian trap in the academic literature. As a result, prosperity was usually a fleeting thing. And the author argues that this sort of anxiety and scarcity mindset that these societies had is something that continues to be ingrained in us today. So we move on next to the third factor. The third possible explanation is also an inherited trait. In this case, a perseverance trait inherited from our hunter ancestors. If in the previous factor, we had to go back to farming societies, to our farming ancestors. Here we have to go back a little bit further to our hunting gatherer ancestors. If you remember your high school biology lessons, you'll remember that one of the key characteristics that distinguishes humans from some of other animals, some of other mammals, is our ability to sweat and to cool down. This is quite important because lions and cheetahs and other type of wildlife hunt through sprints, through short bursts of energy. Whereas humans have evolved a very different strategy. We are proficient long distance runners, capable of running marathons and much larger distances even, uh, with not too much training. How would our ancestors use this characteristic? Hunters would select as a suitable prey and then chase it slowly yet relentlessly over the course of many hours and many kilometers until eventually the animal would actually give up. So at first, of course, the animal through short sprints would outrun the human quite easily, but the human would just continue its slow paced marathon until the animal uh, catch up with the animal, not allow it to rehydrate, not allow it to rest and critically not allow it to cool down. Eventually, after several of these cycles, the animal literally gave up and collapsed. The hunter literally was able to um, come up to the animal and suffocate it with its own hands without the need of any other type of tool to end the, the life's animal. Can you imagine what type of characteristics our ancestors would have to have to be able to hunt in this way? Of course, a huge amount of perseverance and sheer determination, patience, are likely to, to have developed over time to be able to, to hunt and to sustain themselves in this way. And the, argu the author of this book argues that some of these characteristics, of course, are ingrained in us today. And it could be another possible explanation as to why we continue to work so, so hard. All right, let's go to the next factor. The fourth possible explanation uh, explaining why we continue to work so hard is the sickness of infinite aspiration and keeping up with the Joneses. So ultimately, it might just be a question of needs versus wants. While hunter-gatherer societies were able to work 15 hours a week, we know today that this was possible because they cared little for the for status or the accumulation of things. The book describes numerous mechanisms, including light mockery, that tribes would use to keep the ego of their community members in check, particularly for hunters, who had sort of a, a larger prominence, of course. These mechanisms would safeguard the egalitarian nature of the community. The author argues that the move to cities produced a significant shift in this respect, where for the first time, humans were living together in larger settlements with weaker social ties and unclear norms. And for the first time, motivation and ambition was defined by different aspects, more related to aspiration, jealousy, and keeping up with the Joneses. Today, it's quite clear that keeping up with the Joneses is quite a significant factor. It, it can be reflected by a kind of a famous quote. We work really hard to buy things we don't really need to impress people we don't really like. And unfortunately, this is a, a big motivation for a lot of people today. So to summarize, why do we continue to work so hard? 
This fourth factor argues that our wants have a, a sort of increased at a similar pace than these productivity gains. And that explains why we continue to work a similar amount of hours and just as hard as, for example, our grandparents did. All right, let's move on to the fifth factor. The fifth possible explanation is inequality. During most of the 20th century, there was a correlation between labor output and wage growth. In other words, as the economy developed, so did at a similar pace the take-home pay of its workers. However, in the 1980s, there is an event uh, referred by economists as the Great Decoupling, where there's no longer this uh, sort of linear relationship and where economic progress, economic uh, growth and a work output continue to increase. However, the take-home pay and the wages are actually stalled. They, they no longer are correlated. For some economists, this is the first evidence of technological expansion contributing to the accumulation of wealth in fewer hands. The book does present quite shocking inequality figures. CEOs in the US in 1965 earned about 20 times more than the average worker. By the 1980, this had increased to 30 times, so only 15 years later. And 50 years later, in 2015, this had risen to 300 times the take-home pay of the CEO. Since the great decoupling, the 1% of population has amassed just as much a wealth as the rest of the population combined. So to summarize, this fifth factor would argue that uh, we continue to work just as hard as our grandparents did because of inequality. The increases in productivity have not been evenly distributed across society. So we move on to the next factor. We've arrived at our last possible explanation of why we work so hard, and it is that it's just because we have too much energy to burn. For biologists, this might not come as a surprise. There are a lot of behaviors and animal traits that are described by the seasonal overabundance of resources. Uh, there's a seasonal surplus of energy. For example, um, birds that eat in garden feeders are known to remain slim by upping the intensity of which they sing, they fly, and, they and by which they perform other types of behaviors and routines. Similarly, the author presents another interesting uh, case in South Africa. The black male masked weaver builds up to 25 nests in each season, and every time it builds a nest, it then proceeds to destroy it for apparent no reason. The, the most likely hypothesis is thought that they're building and destroying nests for no other reason than just that they have too much energy to burn. The author argues that we are not so dissimilar to other animals as we'd like to think, and that another possible factor explaining why we continue to work so, so hard is our collective success in achieving a very large energy surplus. Could it be that we continue to work so hard in part just because we have too much energy to burn? And with this, we are reaching the end of the video. I hope you found today's uh, video and question uh, together with the possible explanations interesting. In your view, in your experience, what's the factor that most uh, contributes to, to explaining this question? Uh, did I miss, did I leave anyone out or which of the six factors do you think is more prominent? Of course, this book uh, covers a wider range of questions and topics. Um, I highly recommend it. I really think it's one of the best books I've read this year. The author sort of takes, takes you on a journey all the way back to 300,000 years ago and examines the relationship that humans have had with work uh, all the way from the appearance of Homo sapiens uh, to the transition to agriculture, migration to cities, industrial revolution, and our current sort of uh, immersion in this uh, AI revolution. And it really addresses these questions from a very broad range of angles. Um, it, one has the, the feeling that it, the, the author has an academic background. It's very well researched, but at the same time, it's an easy read. So it's, the communication is very fluid and it's very, very easy to go through the book. I highly recommend it. And if you're interested in checking it out, please have a look at the, at the link in the description video below. And I think that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for watching, for staying till the end. And I hope to see you in the next video. Bye. Ciao, ciao.